And Zia really sort of starts this deepening of this process. And some of the things that Zia did, uh, he established Sharia courts for the first time in Pakistani history. He instituted the government collection of the zakat, which is the arms tax. He stripped libraries of books deemed un-Islamic. He mandated compulsory prayer for civil servants. And in the army, they started reading a book called The Quranic Concept of War, which is very influential. And in that book, in fact, says very clearly that terror struck in the heart of the enemies is not only a means, it is an end in itself. And then you have this massive inflow of funds that comes in after the Soviet invasion of 1979. And Zia uses that very intelligently for his own purposes. And he uses that in two ways. Externally, he uses that to fund various jihadist groups that then take on and eventually drive out the Soviets from Afghanistan. But internally, he uses that again to strengthen his hold on Pakistani society. And so the Zia period all the way until 1988 when he dies in a mysterious car crash, that's the kind of the core. And most Pakistani liberals you'll talk to always look upon the Zia period as a turning point. Uh, that, that, that's where some of these bad ideas which were instituted were the sort of, you know, if you think of it as a boulder rolling downhill, it's sort of going slowly in, in Bhutto's time and then it gathers pace in Zia's time. And so that's where the sort of narrative really, really deepens. And that's where also the ISI, which all of you from India and all, actually anyone in the world would be aware of, that's when the ISI starts becoming a really influential organization. Right? So I'll just give you some figures on the ISI. Uh, when Zia took office in 1978, the ISI had 2,000 employees. Ten years later, the ISI had 40,000 employees oh and a budget of a billion dollars a year. And this was a really a creation of that movement to drive out the Soviets, but that became such a powerful organization and remains a powerful organization. It is part of the military. And so it reports the ISI, the head of the ISI is always a general who reports to the chief of the army. And Zia used the ISI, really grew it at this dramatic rate, to go from 2,000 to 40,000 over 10 years, and use that to stamp his will on Afghanistan by funding some of the most fundamentalist of sort of, 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 of Afghan warlords, but also use that to impose his will by stamping out dissent in Pakistan. So that's, this kind of, that, that's the Zia phase. And I would argue that since then, uh, nobody has really been able to stamp it out. There's been sort of, you've had phases since the death of Zia in 1988. You've had phases when Pakistan's been democratic, uh, with Benazir Bhutto, with Nawaz Sharif. Benazir Bhutto twice, Nawaz Sharif twice, now Zardari. You've had phases when Pakistan was ruled by the military, Parvez Musharraf, from 1999 to 2008. But under both those circumstances, uh, it's been very difficult to entirely wipe out these groups. Part of it is because they've built this giant infrastructure. Um, you know, if you look at the number of madrasas in, 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 in Pakistan, just again, one sort of startling statistic. In 1947, what is, today's had, what is Pakistan today had 137 madrasas. Guess what the number is now? Anyone have a? 10,000? Yeah, 13,000. So 137 to 13,000. And again, I have to stress the vast majorities of, the majority of these are peaceful. I mean, you can't sort of, it's, it's not automatic, you can't make. But about 10 to 15% of them, which is a small percentage, but it's still very large in, in, in numbers, 10 to 15% of them have links with some kind of sectarian violence, either of the terrorist kind, groups like LET and so on, or of the sectarian kind, which really in Pakistan involves Sunnis attacking Shia. And so this kind of, this profusion, what was sort of put into place in terms of an, in terms of an educational infrastructure, creating these ideas and turning out students who believed in these ideas, was put in place by Zia. 
No government, whether civilian or military, has been willing to or able to take this on. Similarly, in terms of foreign policy, Pakistan has, it drew a lesson from Afghanistan, which was that if it had the right kind of people who were motivated and had discipline and passion, they could humble a, a superpower. And so what you saw immediately, as soon as the Soviets left, of, left Afghanistan, was that these same people were turned towards Kashmir and turned towards India and Kashmir. And of course, that conflict has been ongoing. Right now, it's, a, it's relatively peaceful, but it's come at the, at, at the cost of great suffering in Kashmir and the cost of many lives lost. I think the Pakistanis probably underestimated the Indian go government's will to stay. <coughs> Uh, and then, of course, after 9-11 happened, some of the geopolitics of it changed. So you kind of have the, the ISI, which people are divided about what the ISI wants for Pakistan itself. Because there are elements of the army and elements of the ISI which themselves are, in fact, uh, belong to the old Pakistani tradition, in the sense that they, want in the, they, they don't want their own state to be organized. They don't want the Taliban deciding what their daughters can wear. But they're quite happy to have the Taliban <coughs> running things in Afghanistan because that creates a proxy state for them and gives them what they call strategic depth. And they're quite happy to fund various jihadist proxies, such as the lashkar e Taiba, to attack India. But there are also elements within the ISI and the army who actually are, are sympathetic. And the question really is, no one has a, has a great answer for this right now, is to what degree can this balance which so far has been maintained where the people who want to completely radicalize Pakistani society themselves, if they take control of the army, then what would be the prospects for Pakistan? It hasn't happened right now. Um, some people argue that it's unlikely to happen because the top generals generally keep things in control. But the short answer is we don't know what, what that is. So let me just, so if I were to sort of sum up uh, the story of Pakistan, I would say that you know, what are the lessons there? And I would say the single biggest lesson is that if you're dealing with a matter of principle, whether it's freedom of freedom of worship or non-discrimination on the basis of gender or anything, if you're dealing with a principle, you have to hold the line. Because what Pakistan did early on was that it decided that it thought it could make small compromises and those small compromises turned into bigger compromises, and the bigger compromises turned into still bigger compromises. And they fed the beast to a point where now even those, and I believe there are many people there who want to fight it, uh, feel that they don't have the capacity to do so any longer. So the most important thing I think when, when it comes to, when I, when I think of radical Islam anywhere, and when I think of radical Islamic states, such as Iran, for example, is that you have to, you don't have to be a warmonger, but you have to accept that a certain amount of firmness is required because without that, uh, that is, if, you're, if you're not firm, that's viewed as weakness. And the Islamists I have met, for example, in my travels in Indonesia, they're really driven by this passionate idea that they are going to win, that history is on their side, that the future is theirs, and the only way to peg this back is, in fact, to oppose it, and to oppose it with ideas, not necessarily to oppose it on, to oppose it with ideas, to oppose it with better ideas, but it's certainly not something where that, that can be appeased. I think that's the kind of uh, lesson, that's, that, that's what I would say is the tragic lesson of Pakistan. And so, well, thank you for your patience with my rambling talk, and now I'm gonna take questions, which is, thank you. Thank you. Do you have time or Zia that the